by everyone else's standards. They looked at me as a success, and what they didn't know back then is that while I had followed all the rules, while I was closing a ton of deals, I was working all the time. And even when I wasn't working, I was thinking about work. Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association, providing benefits and services to real estate investors and rental property owners for over 48 years. With your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And Point Central, the leading provider of enterprise scale smart home automation for short and long term rental property managers. Learn more at pointcentral.com. Hello and welcome to episode 109. In 2007, Sean McCloskey had achieved his real estate dreams. He was having tremendous success doing short sales and pre-foreclosure investing, and he was making a lot of money in the process. But deep down, he knew he was working way too much, and he was becoming consumed by his business. He needed a better balance. What he did to find that balance and still remain prosperous and successful in real estate is what has brought him to the show today. And it's what he'll be talking about when he joins us at the RPOA's annual Real Estate Investor and Landlord Conference and Expo, which is happening next week, February 22nd through 24th of 2018, right here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And you can register for free by going to rpoaonline.org. That's rpoaonline.org, and you can register for free. Uh, Sean will be speaking Saturday, February 24th from 3.30 to 5.30, and his topic is all about becoming a life and heir in order to change your life and achieve your real estate goals. So, Sean, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to learning more about what a life and heir is and learning more about your story. Welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me, man. It's great to be here. I'm looking forward to coming up to uh, Michigan here pretty soon share this message with everybody yeah and we're excited to have you this topic life and air is really interesting before we we get into it i really want to know about you before 2007 uh, you were having yeah. real estate success what were you doing right and what were you doing wrong oh man uh what was i doing right there's a small list and then what was i doing wrong there's a really big list so i don't know how long we got for the interview but <laughs> <laughs> man we i started out you know in 2003 and the market's sort of going up and and started out, you know, I, I lost my job, and I thought, I'm going to flip houses so I never have another job again. And I did that, and I uh, got a lot of lessons on the way. I've, I've done now more than 300 deals. I've only ever lost money on three of those, so I think that's hopefully pretty decent. But unfortunately, the first one that I ever lost money on was the very first deal that I ever did, and that was a that was a pretty big one, man. I lost 87 grand on that first one. So Ouch. a lot of people hear that and they go, how did you stay in? And uh, I don't know. I think I had some mental problems, so I just kept staying in, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, man, started out with that. And I, I, what I did was I went out and I just tried to learn as much as I possibly could. And I decided if I'm going to go learn from these, you know, quote, gurus, then I'm going to do everything that they teach me to do. So I did that. And pretty soon I had a business that was – uh, producing quite a bit of fruit. I was flipping 60, 70 houses a year. By everyone else's standards from the outside looking in, they looked at me, you know, fast forward a few years to 2007, 08, they looked at me as a success. And what they didn't know back then is that while I had followed all the rules, while I was closing a ton of deals, I was working all the time. And even when I wasn't working, I was thinking about work. You know what I mean? Like if you ever gone on a vacation or something and and you're on vacation, or maybe even it's just a date night out with your wife or something, and you're on vacation or date night, and you're there physically. <laughs> you ever done that, though, where you're not there mentally? Oh, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah so, Guilty as charged. Uh, that was like the story of my life where I had grown this business. I had followed all the rules. I had done everything that the gurus taught me to do, and I was performing. I was closing a lot of deals, you know, on the outside looked very successful, and yet I'm having more of those moments than ever before where I just can't be present anymore because my mind is always thinking about business. And, um, you know, woke up one day and kind of got sick and tired of being sick and tired. So uh, what was interesting, too, is I, I around 2007, that's when I started getting asked to speak. And, you know, people are looking at my business. They're going, man, you're flipping so many houses. Can you show us what you're doing? 
And so then I went out and I started speaking and sharing. Now, in the beginning, it was kind of almost against my will. I did it as a, a sort of a uh, favor to a friend, and I spoke at their real estate investor club, and uh, I shared everything I knew. And next thing you know, I had people wanting me to coach them. And so, you know, I took on a couple of coaching students right there in the beginning, and it's crazy. Here, here we are in 2008. The market's starting to tank, and I take on my first student. His name was Jeremy, and Jeremy goes out his first year, makes a half a million dollars his first year in business. Oh my gosh! And you know, and obviously, look outsider looking in goes, "Oh, what a success!" Well, guess what? Second year, he gets a divorce, mm. and it's like, man, I just taught him how to do everything that I've been doing, which is he now has no life just like I don't have one. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like on the outside looking in, he looks successful. You, if you, if you quantify success just by how much money he made, then my gosh, he's very successful. But when you look at what that did to the rest of his life, you know, you start to go, is that really what success looks like? And so that's exactly what happened to me. And then, you know, then life and air gets introduced and all of a sudden it's like, well, wait a second, didn't we get into business so that we could have freedom you know, how is it that I'm in business for myself and I feel less free than ever? And so all of those questions sort of came to fruition at once, right around that 2007, 2008 time frame. And uh, here we are today, many years later, where we teach people how to have both. You know, ideally, you'd like to make a really good income this year and have a life in the process, not just give it all up so that someday you can have a life. Absolutely. I'm glad that makes sense so far. Yeah. So, yeah, it makes perfect sense. And we will get into life and air here, but I, I want to go back and just kind of dwell on, on, on the pre-2007 Sean McCloskey. Yeah. You kind of inverted the formula that is typical in these conversations. One, one is that you, you lost your job, and, and it seems like that's what propelled you into, into real estate investing. Yep. Um, but immediately out of the gate, you lost $87,000. Hey, man, why you got to bring that up again? I thought we were past that. <laughs> yeah, you forget. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, five minutes ago. But, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, right there, it's like that would have that would have stopped anybody. But, yeah. But, uh, again, you, you inverted the formula or flipped the script or whatever, and, and you went on to, to uh, you know, big success, 300 deals and, and, you, and, and all that. And then you were also um, successful during the Great Recession when everyone else was falling off the board. Yeah. You, you were thriving. So um, you're right. A lot of people would look at that and say, wow, you know, on, on, from the outside, you, you seem very successful and, and prosperous, and you know something that everyone else doesn't. Um, but, yeah, I, let's just let's kind of take – there's a couple pieces there I want to take. One is that losing your job – and transitioning to real estate, losing eighty-seven thousand dollars. I mean, how? What was that like? Oh man, it was all. Well, here, here's the worst thing about it. And so I didn't lose all eighty-seven thousand in one fell swoop because I didn't have eighty-seven thousand to lose. So, um, to make the long story short, I tried to sell this house, couldn't sell it, ended up renting it. Um, and by the way, the repairs ended up being way more than I thought. You know, then when you put it on the market, the agents tell you it'll sell for one thing, and it didn't sell for that. And so I ended up renting it, and I ended up losing that amount. Um, instead of just ripping a Band-Aid off, it slowly sucked the life out of me over the next four years to where the $87,000 loss wasn't completely recognized up front. I did recognize about 30000 of the loss up front. The next of it was a s slow, painful uh, bleeding to death over the next four years. Mm -hmm. And then I had to to make things worse. This house was right down the street from where I live, so every day I'd be in a great mood, be driving home from work, you know, here we are three years later, great mood, drive home from work and then I see that freaking house again, you know. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I hate this house so much, you know, so, oh, there, I mean, I could write a book on the lessons from that. So, really, I got an $87,000 seminar is what I got. Uh -huh. And um, I'm a big fan of education now, you know, you're either going to get it through experience or you're going to pay for it. So, I, I try to listen now to what I learn at events like you guys are putting on with uh, RPOA and what you guys are doing. I try to learn from the best of the best. The one thing I'm cautious with now when I learn is I want to make sure that I'm learning what also fits my lifestyle and what I want my ultimate life vision to look like because back when I was learning from some of the gurus that I was learning from, 
you know, some of them really knew how to run a business, but some of them, not all of them, there's some really good ones too, but some of them had no life just like I had years later. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm learning, just like Jeremy, my student, is learning how to run a business and not have a life from me. I was learning that from some other guys, too, that were really successful business-wise. But, you know, these are guys that were on their third marriage, and they work 90 hours a week. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. So I try to figure out a little bit of that when I decide who to learn from. That's why I like how you guys screen who you have there and um, make sure you're bringing in some really good people. That's important. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm on the uh, the conference committee, and I know that we spend a lot of time really uh, picking and, and, and uh, debating who, who we're going to invite to the conference. So Yeah. Uh, That's why I'm so excited to have you there. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about Green Property Management. Not only do they manage everything from single-family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area, they also manage my entire portfolio. So I can tell you from personal experience that their unique flat fee management style is worth a closer look. If you feel that your property isn't operating to its fullest potential, then Green Property Management can help you take a holistic approach that will save you money, eliminate your head and increase your net income. And if you're a property manager interested in applying Green Property Management's model, give them a call at 1-866-95-GREEN or visit them on the web at greenpropertymgt.com. You know, I think a lot of people listening to this can probably identify with what you're saying. I mean, people who are who are successful, um, but working all the time and, and consumed by by what they're doing. Um, what Just, just to uh, kind of get get through to them, what are some of the signs they should be looking for uh, that they're, uh, th- you know, they're kind of working too hard and consumed by their business? Well, first of all, no one ever sets out and aims to have their life look like that. No, no one does. I mean, this is no different. I used to be in the pre-foreclosure business. That was uh, probably 200 of the 300 deals I did were short sales and pre-foreclosure deals. Um, it's very similar to that. Like I, I remember going on appointments with homeowners that are behind on payments or they're about to be behind. They're in one of the toughest points of their life. They're going to lose their home to foreclosure or, in some cases, their entire rental portfolio and so on. And I'll tell you this, not one of those people that I ever went on a, an appointment with, not one, ever intended to be in the position they were in. Not one. <laughs> no one ever said, I'm going to buy this house, and hopefully five years from now I'm going to lose it to foreclosure. You know, just like that in business. Nobody ever starts out in business saying, you know what I really want? I really want to work 90 hours a week and be so consumed by my business that I can't even go to Cancun and sit on the beach without thinking about what's going on in business back home. No one says that. So for the, the newer people, a lot, a lot of times they hear a message like this, think, well, that's not going to be me. You know, it's the, it's the invincible approach, which I had to. You know, I'm never going to do that. I'm just not going to be as stupid as those other guys who, you know, where I'm just going to do it for a little bit. And this is the lie we tell ourselves. I'm just going to do it just for a little bit, just until I hit, hit a certain level of success, and then I'll have it all, then I can have a life. But it unfortunately doesn't work that way. Um, I have a, a guy that I have spent a little time coaching right now, and he's been trying to convince me, which, by the way, he's working 100 hours a week right now, 100. Wow. He's been trying to convince me that he's only going to do this for the next two years because at the end of two years, then he gets to retire, and then he can do whatever he wants the rest of his life. But here's the challenge. There's no guarantee at the end of two years that he's going to have any level of success at all. This is why when the economy changes, you hear of people jumping out of you know, 60-story buildings because they had all of their hopes defined by let me you know let me work let me build a business all of their identity is built into their business all of their hopes are in the business and if the business doesn't perform heaven forbid i know none of us plan for that but if the business doesn't perform then they go oh my gosh i wasted all my life for nothing so what we try to encourage people with is design the business in the way that serves your life now not just 10 15 20 years from now or five years from now or whatever it is Design your business in a way that serves your life so that you can enjoy it right now and make really good money as well um, instead of just saying someday, maybe then. You know, It's like the, the someday, maybe thens are usually the ones that never, never – well, here, here's an example. There are many, many life and heirs that happen to be millionaires. There are very, very few millionaires that are actually life and heirs. We haven't even gone into what life and heir even means yet, but you, you can kind of tell just by the word. I mean yeah. – the word life in air, obviously, it's like the word millionaire, but with a life. So we encourage, you know, let's, let's design a business with having it all. Here, here's an example, if 
I can just throw one out there real quick. Please. When I started in business, I thought, I'm willing to work longer and harder than anybody. So I did all this marketing in my real estate business, and all these phone calls would come in. And when the phone calls would come in, I would think, man, nobody answers the phone better than me. Nobody's more committed to helping these people than me. So I answer the phone. So guess what time people usually called in? 24 hours a day. They called in any time of day and night. <laughs> So some people would call literally at 2 o'clock in the morning, and I would wake up, and I would literally answer the phone and take their call. And I did this because I thought, man, first of all, I'm willing to work right now. I'm young. I don't have kids at the time. Not married quite yet. And I'm willing to put in the work. Um, and, you know, nobody takes the calls better than me anyway. Plus, I'm spending all this money on marketing. i got to make sure the calls get answered. Well, that's all fine and dandy. However... If I would have designed my business with what I wanted out of life in mind first, there's no way I would have answered calls at 2 o'clock in the morning. So instead, now I'm answering calls all day, all night. So now I am in a relationship with my now wife, and we're dating, and we start to go out on date night. And guess what? We're out of date night, and the phone rings, and it's a marketing call. And I now have two choices. I can either answer the phone right there at dinner on a date night with my now wife, or I can not answer the phone, and I can sit there and I can think, oh, man, I wonder how much money I just wasted in marketing on that call that I'm not going to answer. And I wonder if they're just going to hang up and call my competition now <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and sell somebody else their house. What a waste. And so in either case, my date night is affected, right? So if I answer the phone, my average phone call took 18 minutes. So if I answer the phone at date night, I'm on the phone for, on average, 18 minutes, sometimes shorter, sometimes longer. If I don't answer the phone, I'm now consumed with, did that person leave a message? Am I going to be able to call them tomorrow? Did they just call my competition? All this stuff. So either way, I'm kind of screwed. You know, It's like I don't get to have a life either way with that business. Let's talk for a moment about Point Central, the leading provider of enterprise scale smart home automation for short and long term rental property managers, and how their exciting technology can help you control property access to vendors and potential tenants. No more time wasted waiting for late appointments or no shows. Oversee energy usage and analyze data in order to reduce utility and maintenance expenses. Eliminate the cost of keys or rekeying locks. Command higher rents and increase tenant retention and provide tools for tenants and managers to monitor the property to improve safety and security and it's all done through cloud technology utilizing encrypted data and private cellular service and best of all the return on investment of installing point central's technology is upwards of 25 percent a year the future of property management is here and you can find out more by visiting pointcentral.com yeah, and i'm sure anyone who owns rental property and manages their own properties and has tenants calling them all the time can identify with what you just said. Absolutely. Yeah. But is that what they wanted? I mean, here, did, did anybody get into the rental business and say, you know what I really want in the rental business? I really want to take phone calls if the toilet's clogged up at 3 o'clock in the morning where I have to drop everything I'm doing and go over there right now. Nobody ever said that. What they wanted was the benefits of that business. They want the cash flow. They want what they believe the lifestyle will be with that. And you can have all those things, but we have to design it properly from the start. That's where Life Inner comes in. Okay. So did you hit some sort of low point or bottom in your, in your being consumed by your business where you said this has to change? And, and what was the genesis of that change? Man, that's a great question. Um, I, I hit a couple of them, but one that really screams out is, you're going to think I'm nuts. One of the worst days of my life was the day I made $102,000 on a deal. Hmm. I literally, I bought the house. I owned it for about an hour. I sold it the same day and I made $102,000 and it was an awful day for me. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear and, that. <laughs> people hear that. They're like, what's wrong with you, dude? Um, I'm here. The reason it was awful is because I had built this business. You know, people see me closing 60, 70 deals a year and they think it's all glamorous, right? Well, I now had staff. I now had an office. I now had overhead. I now had debt. I now had hard money loans. All of these things, my, my monthly expenses just to live, run my business, were $34,000 a month. And so, you know, when it takes that much to operate a business, now, uh, you know, obviously, is it ever possible to go one or two months without doing a deal? Well, sure. If I go two months without doing a deal, I'm $70,000 in the hole 
just to break even just with my expenses. And so the reason that that day was awful is because I, I'd just done the deal of my life, $102,000, most I'd ever made in a deal in my whole life. And I just realized in that moment that just bought me three months of freedom. You know, biggest deal of my whole life, which five years earlier, that would have, oh my gosh, I'd have been able to live off of that for at least a year or two or three. And now it's the biggest deal of my life and I got three months of freedom. And if I don't hustle and get another deal month four, I got another 34 grand in expenses coming month four and I'm going to be in the hole again. Yeah. So now it just has made you even busier. Yeah. So, you know, so then you, you, your mind plays the game of, well, why don't I just get some more money in the bank and then I'll be safe? You know, it's kind of like the guys who say, well, if I just, let me just get the business a little bit better, then I'll have a life. Then I'll be able to take the vacation. Then I'll be able to travel. Then I'll be able to spend time with the kids or whatever. It's this spiraling little trap that we get into. So I did. I went out. I was like, okay, let me get a hundred grand in the bank. And I did that. I was like, well, that only bought me three months. So then I get 200 grand in the bank. I'm like, well, let me do that. You know, well, <laughs> that just bought me six months. Well, let me get a little bit more. And pretty soon, you know, I'm putting all this money away. And then I've got this so-called security, and I'm afraid to touch any of it because what if the market changes? And, you know, it was this constant uh, area of fear, like a lot of fear-based action. And I had never designed my business to be like that. That's just kind of what it turned into. And now I've got employees and staff that are relying on me to, to help them feed their families and everything. And it just turned into a, a business that was very stress-related. You know, it wasn't – it was no longer the joy that I felt when I first got into business and I went on a homeowner appointment and I really got to help them out of their situation. Now, when we would go on appointments, first of all, I had a guy doing that for me, so I didn't get the joy of doing that anymore. And now when there's an appointment, it's like it's a number – up on the board in the office. It's like, forget about helping the homeowner. We got to hit payroll this month. So get them signed up, get them in the system and get them into the, into the, you know, assembly line and let's turn it into some profit. It just changed, you know, and none of that, that was ever, ever intentional, but that's what happened when we started doing the volume that we were doing with, you know, the staff that we were doing with the overhead and all those things that all of the gurus were teaching me, this is the right way to run your business. Had I actually run my business with my vision in mind, I would have made a lot of different choices. So that's what I do today, and that's what I teach other people how to do, is design the vision for what do you – this sounds so corny, too. Design the vision for what you want your life to look like, and then let's reverse engineer a business to make sure the business gives you every single thing that you say you want out of life. And let's do it now, not like 10 years from now. Does that make sense at all? Yeah, that, that makes great sense. Uh, and I, I take it that's the, the whole principle behind life and air. Yep. Um, so how did, you, how did you come upon that principle? I mean, you know, it stresses me out just listening to you talk about your, your business. <laughs> you, you had, what was it, 37000 a month just to, just to cover your expenses. Oh, right. Um, yeah, yeah, it's one thing to come up with this, this, these principles or this principle, there, it's another to put it into practice uh, sure. and, and turn that ship around. So how, how did how did you come up with this, and then how did how did you put it into practice? Well, I didn't come up with it. I uh, I went and started learning these principles from a guy named Steve Cook, and uh, he is my now business partner in Life and Air. We co-wrote the Life and Air book together, but. He uh, he and I started to be pretty good friends back then. Matter of fact, he, he used to own the website FlippingHomes.com years ago. Um, I don't even think there's anything there now today, but uh, it used to be a very active website. And so Steve ran that, and so there was you know thousands of people that went to that site every day. So And then Steve also spoke around the country like I was starting to do as well. And so I was sharing some of these challenges with Steve one day over the phone, you know, I mean, not only when when you're in business, you're almost on this island by yourself, or at least it seems like sometimes, because who do you go to with your problems? You know, when you're the boss, it's not like when I had a job. I can't just go to the boss and say, hey, I'm struggling with this and help me out. you got to figure it out on your own. So I go to Steve, because I know he's a business owner, and he's spe <clears throat> speaking, and he's getting all these people from the website that are looking up to him, and I just said, man, do you ever feel like maybe you're not helping people, you know? Because I'm, I'm starting to feel like a fraud. I, I help this dude, Jeremy, make 500 grand in a year, and he's divorced his second year. I feel like a fraud. And Steve shared with me. He goes, man, he goes, 
I have been asked at the last three events that I've taught, people have come up to me and said, Steve, you've got to show me how to make a million dollars this year. He said, so I just started asking people, what is it about this word millionaire that is so attractive to people? And he said, this is going to sound crazy, but he said, I was sitting there, I was in quiet time, I was just saying my prayers, and I was saying, you know, God, what is it about this word millionaire that just has people cling to it so harshly? And he said, I heard this little still small voice. He said, call me crazy if you want, but I heard in my head, I heard, Steve, they don't want to be a millionaire. What they want is life. They want to be a life and heir. And he's like, what? <laughs> you know, so he immediately goes out and gets the do- domain name. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, and uh, ever since then, it's been this process of discovery to figure out what does that even mean? What, what does it mean? How do you pull it off? Well, first of all, what does it mean? And then how do you actually pull it off? Especially, you made a great analogy a second ago. When you've got a ship that's blazing down the sea at X amount of miles an hour, how do you turn that ship when it's already set in motion? And uh, I will tell you that it's not always an easy process. Now, it is. It's much simpler when you can start out with this message. Um, when you're like me and you're you know, five, six years deep into the business and you've got expenses and overhead and staff and all this other stuff, it's not easy to turn some of it around, but it's totally possible. And I'll also tell you it's totally worth it. Because today, my expenses are nowhere near thirty-four grand a month. Matter of fact, if I make thirty-four grand this month, I get to keep almost all of it, or I can give it away, or I can go on vacation, or I can. <laughs> sky's the limit, you know. When the expenses go down, which by the way, now when I'm running my business, I don't take phone calls during dinner or at two o'clock in the morning. I have that that is handled. Uh, and I should mention, I don't just live as a life and heir off of the backs of other people, too. I make sure that if there's areas of the business that need to get done, they're done by people who that is their area of gifting, you know, um, and I do the same thing. So today, that doesn't mean I don't ever have any stress anymore. It doesn't mean that there's never any challenges or problems or anything like that. But today, when I wake up in the morning, I love getting out of bed, whereas I will tell you in 07, 08, when I was at the peak of doing the most deals, the the most successful by most of the world's um, definition, <laughs> it's nowhere near the same as that. Um, it's just night and day difference. And the difference is I started by creating my vision for what I want my life to look like. And I know that sounds corny, but that's how you start. And that's I'm going to show you guys specifically how to do it, specific to real estate investors. I'm going to show you guys this at RPOA when, uh, when we come and, and share the message there. But there's a specific set of... of the steps that you can take to design this the way that you want it, with sky's the limit, however you would want it to look, if it could look any way you want it to look, and then we build a business that serves that vision instead of what everybody else does. Everybody else just builds a business, hopes that it makes money, and then someday when it makes money, then I'm going to get to have this life. We do it the exact opposite. We say design the life that you want. Now let's make sure a business fits into that. If it doesn't, let's tweak it, make some changes, and so on. So how do you steer the ship? Well, it's the, the ship needs to be going in the direction of what your vision looks like, not just your business plan. That makes sense. Yeah. So what were some of the things that you decided were part of your vision at, at that point? And, and uh, yeah, how did you, like, you were so consumed by your business. How, how did you even know what you wanted your life to look like? That's a great question, man. Um, well, let me start by telling you what I didn't want, because sometimes that's easier for people, especially if people are feeling any amount of pain, it's easier to say, well, I, you know, I don't want to be fat anymore. Or I don't want to be in that awful relationship anymore. So for me, one of the things that I never really consciously signed up for was debt. Now, I had read Robert Kiyosaki and all these other books that was like, well, there's a difference between good debt and bad debt, and good debt is really good, and you use it to buy leveraged stuff. Here, here's the challenge. Good debt is really good when the asset is performing. So like if you have a rental property and the rental property uh, is being paid for every month by the tenant, it doesn't feel so bad. You get to have the tenant make your payment for you and hopefully you get a little spread in between. The challenge I have with that is on the months where the tenant doesn't pay. <laughs> you know, it doesn't feel like such good debt that month, right? And that's the chapter that I think Kiyosaki forgot to put in the book. Um, what happens when the debt doesn't feel so good? So in my vision, when I looked at my vision, after I had sort of just, you know, almost puked out on the paper everything that I would want my life to look like, I made an observation. Debt wasn't on there. And yet here I am, $1.1 million in debt, most of it for good reasons, 
you know, uh, or so quote so called good debt. But there were many times where it just didn't feel good. Matter of fact, even in my rentals, there were some months where I'd have a few vacancies, and all the ones that were full ended up paying for the ones that were full, but also. All of my profit went to the ones that were vacant, and I had to come up with another five or ten grand in a month to rehab one that somebody trashed before they left. And it's like, wait a second, they didn't tell me about this in the rental book. You know what I mean? And so, debt was one of the things I thought. First of all, I never consciously sat down and said, you know what, I really want in my life, I really want some more debt. <laughs> you know, that was always just a vehicle in which I was taught to get things faster. Like if I want a rental property, don't save up and pay cash for one. Just go get a loan and get one right now, right? Same thing with uh, the house you want or anything else, fill in the blank. But I realized when I did this process, debt was not on there. So that was one of the first things that I started to tackle getting rid of. And I'll tell you, once the debt, now it took me four years to get rid of $1.1 million, but I'll tell you this, the amount of stress that exited my life when I was no longer in debt anymore was, it was immeasurable. It's crazy. And, and here's what I'll tell you too. I'm going to talk about this when I come to RPOA. You can have a 100% free and clear rental property portfolio of 10 to 12 properties in a year, in a year. If you think outside the box a little bit, the problem is people aren't taught this. And they aren't taught this because loans are so easy to get. You know, it's, it's the fast approach to it. We're taught just go get a loan for everything. And my question to you is, what if you could accomplish the same thing, which what people want in a rental property portfolio, for example, they want cash flow. What if you could accomplish the same thing, get the cash flow on a free and clear property without the downside of having to make a payment if it goes vacant? Not if, when it goes vacant. Would you be willing to learn that? And of course, everybody always says yes. But we don't, we're not taught to even think this way because, quite frankly, it's so easy to not have to. It's so easy to just go out and get a loan for the same exact thing. But I don't make decisions based off of what somebody else teaches now. I don't make decisions based off of how easy it is to get a loan. I make decisions based off my vision. And nowhere in my vision did it ever say, you should be in debt. And so I make different decisions now. So assessing your relationship with debt and your use of debt was, was definitely part of your, your life and air strategy and, and your vision. What, what else was part of that? Oh, it was being present with my family. You know, when we have dinner time and I have date night with my wife, being present with my wife, not having to answer the phone. Matter of fact, not only not having to answer the phone, not having the phone ring so that I have to make a choice. You know, that was one of those things like I could be out with my wife at date night before and not answer the phone, but I would see the call coming in. And so, you know, people say, well, how did you fix that? Well, my gosh, there's thousands of ways to fix these challenges. And that's going to be some of the challenges that you're going to have after you leave RPOA. You're going to have to figure out how am I going to do this? So I'm going to give you some examples, but this is a creative process. You can do whatever you want. So for me, I hired a live answering service to answer my calls after four o'clock in the afternoon. I thought, I can answer the calls between 9 a.m. and 4. Now, I don't even do that anymore, but back then, I said between 9 a.m. and 4, I'll still answer the calls, and then after 4, I'm going to have a live answering service pick up the calls where it automatically gets forwarded to the, auto, to, the, to the call service so I can't even see a call coming in at that moment. And then I don't have to make a decision. Then I'm not distracted at date night. Then I can enjoy my wife and be present with her. Same thing with the kids. So, you know, if I were living my vision beforehand, I would have made a lot of different decisions in how I was running my business. Plus, now I look at even my employees different. Um, I heavily, my, my employees are heavily benefited when we succeed, but I don't pay big salaries anymore. So my staff actually makes more now than what I would have paid them before, but it's when I also get paid, if that makes sense. So now instead of me having to spend thirty four grand a month, whether we do a deal or not, I have a small set of expenses, just like anybody else does. Um, but my expenses are small now, and I pay out more of a reward when we all do well together, if that makes sense. Sure. You, you've incentivized your employees to be more proactive in getting the work done and, and making the money. That's right. You initially had, had felt 
you know, before you, you developed a life and air strategy that you needed to be the one to answer the phones. You needed to be the mm. ones to, to do a lot of the work. How difficult was it for you and how painful uh, was it to make that transition from being the one who had to do it to delegating or, or, or finding other ways to get it done? Oh, man, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, it's not easy, man, especially when you're the guy used to doing it all yourself. You know, you, I think I think many business owners tend to have this this lie that we're taught at some age that says, well, nobody can do it better than you, so you just got to buck up and do it. And that's not true, man. There's, uh, listen, I don't care what it is in in just about anything in my business. There's somebody else that can do a better job of it than me. Now, there are some things that I just will never outsource. Here's an example. I will never outsource the final evaluation on a deal to tell me what it's worth from somebody else. I just won't. If I'm going to put up money and risk to go buy a deal, uh, whether I'm flipping it or turning it into a rental or a rehab or whatever it is, I'm going to use my own evaluation for the numbers. That, and by the way, I'm, I do that because the other two of the three deals that I lost money on, I lost money on those two deals because I trusted someone else's opinion of the value. So, but that doesn't mean I can't have people pull the comps for me initially and pull all the data, and then I can review the data and just make sure that it's in alignment with what I think. Um, so I think there are certain tasks in a business that you do need to own up and, and just be that person. However, there's so much more in business that we give ourselves maybe too much credit for, and we choose not to outsource it. I, I've since learned... Not only am I not the best person for most of the jobs that I was trying to do back then, but I can also, if I structure this right, I can structure it in a way that actually is more productive for somebody else to do it. It blesses another family for them to be able to do it, and it actually only increases the bottom line all the way around, doesn't, doesn't take from it. In turning that ship around and, and making these, these changes in the way you approached your work, did you lose business? Did you lose money? Was there was there some real pain involved in that? What man, you got some really solid questions. Um, <laughs> that's a really good question, man. No, now I was scared to death that that's what was going to happen. Here, here's an example of that. When I first started saying, "Okay, I end my day," at first it was like six o'clock, and then it was like, "Okay, then I'm going to wind it back to five, and then eventually it was four. Um, but when I decided at first to end my day at six, you got to understand, I was in the short sale business, and I'm dealing with people who are losing their house, and you got to go on appointments to people's houses to look at their house, right? And so an overwhelming majority of those people would want me to come at night because they either just got a job finally now, and they need to work during the day or whatever else. And so they'd say, well, yeah, you know, I'd love to sell you my house. I'd love to do the short sale with you. Meet me at my house tonight at 630. And my first thought was, oh, man. What am I going to do? Am I going to bend my new vision? My, my vision says that I don't work after 6, but yet everybody's telling me that they can only meet me at 6.30. And so I wanted to bend so badly. And by the way, having a vision doesn't mean you can never bend, but I was basically taking a job that required me to go on appointments at 6.30. So I have a couple choices. Do I not go on the appointments? Do I now hire somebody else to go on the appointments? Do I, you know, what do I do here? Well, the first conversation I had with somebody, I said, unfortunately, we don't do 6.30 appointments at night. I said, we only meet between the hours of 10 and 6. And if you can meet during that time, then I would love to work with you. If you can't, then unfortunately, I just I can't help you. And the guy, I thought for sure, and by the way, this is a deal that I, I wasn't totally excited about, so I could say that with a little bit of confidence behind it, you know what I mean? Um, but the guy goes, well... He goes, you don't do any appointments at 630? And I go, no, it's, it's just our, our policy. And he goes, okay, well, I guess I could take tomorrow off. How about you just come over here at like 1030 tomorrow? And I was like, okay. <laughs> and we booked the appointment. And he budged. And then I was like, wait a second. That worked really well there. I wonder if it would work again. So I tried it again. And next thing you know, it worked again. I mean, this is no different than, like, if I want to go buy a car here in St. Louis, I know that the car dealership is only open certain hours. I don't say, well, car dealership, you need to open up at 11 and let me buy a car there because that's when it works for me. The car dealership has their boundaries in place, and they honor those boundaries. But why don't real estate investors do this? You know, I, when I started to have boundaries in place, my whole life changed. Then, 
after six o'clock, I didn't have to even think about appointments. My phone wasn't ringing anymore. And in real life, just that alone started to help me get a little more present in my life again. Um, but I also, when I realized I never lost any business as a result, it was a game changer. Yeah, wow. Set, setting boundaries, that, that really made a, a difference. Plus, there's a little psychological thing there. You know, as as business people, we it's it's our inclination to kind of bend over backwards to make business happen. Sure. And and when you change that mindset to where, well, I'm not going to bend. Let's let the other person come to me. Uh, that can really have a profound difference. It does, and people respect it. I've found. You know, even in my, I you know, I coach a number of people. I coach national speakers. I coach really big uh, real estate investors all over the country, and and some small ones too. Um, but I have boundaries in place with my coaching program. I, I had one girl that was going to join with me about a year ago, and she said, okay, I just need to make sure that, you know, when I need something that, that you're going to be there, like you're going to answer your cell phone when I call. And I said, no, this program is not for you. And she goes, well, what do you mean? And I said, I have boundaries in place. I said, we have certain calls that are on certain days. That's what the whole program's a- about. <laughs> yeah. I said, I have them scheduled a year in advance. You're coming to me asking for me to teach you how to be a life and heir, step number one is have boundaries. So how can I teach you how to do that if I don't have any of my own? Here's what the program is, and you either like it or you don't. And if you don't, I'm okay with that. And you know what she said? She goes, I love that. Why don't I have any boundaries? And she signed up. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> people respect it when you actually put it into play. And uh, I found it uh, has done nothing but gain me business. I've lost nothing from it. Now, uh, you know what I should mention, too? I don't do as many deals today as I used to do. I don't need to. I don't have to do. Listen, back then I had to make 34 grand a month just to make payroll and expenses and debt payments and all that stuff. Today, my total expenses to run my life and my business, everything. I got kids that go to private school, all of that. I can run my whole life and business maybe 5 grand a month. I mean that and that's kind of pushing it. So that means I have $29,000 a month extra freed up that I don't have to pay anymore. So um, I, it's crazy how this works, too. Like, and a big part of this was having boundaries in place. Like, I remember um, a few years ago, my son and I, um, my son was like six years old, and he said, Dad, you've always been wanting a Jeep. Why don't we go buy a brand new Jeep? And I was never a fan of buying brand new cars because they depreciate so fast, whatever. Well, Jeeps apparently hold their value pretty well. So I decided I'm going to go buy a new Jeep. And I was sitting there in the dealership stroking a check for this Jeep and had everything on it, you know. And I, as I'm writing the check, I realized this is what it used to cost me to run my life for one month. One month. And I basically got a free Jeep out of what it used to cost me to run my life for a month. Today, it's no longer like that. Nice, nice. So for the people listening out there who are, are able to come hear you speak at the RPOA conference, what can you tell them that, that'll, that'll get them to, to, to actually take that leap and, 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 and come to Grand Rapids February 24th or 22nd through 24th uh, yep. in a couple of weeks? Well, what are they going to get out of, out of your presentation? Well, I'm going to show them specifically how to pull this off, and there's actually four stages to pulling this off. Um, we call it four stages to financial prosperity. And so if you guys will give me, I believe I have roughly 90 minutes that, while I'm there. So if you guys will give me 90 minutes, I'm going to fly in. I'm going to show you these four stages. And if you apply these, and but you have to apply them in the right order too. But if you apply these four stages, it is really hard to screw it up. <laughs> You know, because I'm going to tell you right now, stage one is creating your life and your vision. And if that's the first stage, and then we're going to show you how to pull that off financially with stage two, three, and four. Um, but if you start with that and you identify what it is that you want your life to look like, then I can help you design a business. And so you can take everything that you're learning from all of the other speakers that are going to be there, and you can sort of apply everything else that you learned to your own vision and make sure you're structuring your business in a way that honors everything that you say is important to you. So here's, here's a perfect example. So I had one friend of mine, I asked him, what's most important to you in, in life? And he said, my family. Now, this is a guy who has been working roughly 70, 80 hours a week for probably 12 years now. And when I asked him why he's doing it, he said for his family. Matter of fact, specifically, he said for his daughter. 
but he only sees his daughter. His daughter's six years old now, and he sees his daughter about 20 minutes a day because he's so busy. And this is a guy that has 1,100 rental properties, to give you an idea. So he's built up quite a little empire for himself. And um, so I said, really, what is it about your daughter that you, that you want for her? And he said, I never want her to have to work how I had to work. And so I said, okay, so how long are you going to have to keep working this schedule in order to supply her with what you need to supply her with? Hey, so I already got it all figured out. Ten years from now, I am financially free. Ten years from now, he said, I have all 1,100 of these properties paid for because I'm paying them down rapidly. And in ten years, my daughter will never have to work a day in her life. He said, at that time, I'll have something like 750 grand a month coming in, positive cash flow. It's insane. He said, she'll never have to work a day in her life at all, and I'm doing this for her. And I said, well, that's interesting. Because 10 years from now, she's six right now, right? And he said, yep. I said, well, 10 years from now, how old is she going to be? Alan was his name. How old is she going to be, Alan? And he said, 16. And I said, so then you can spend all the time in the world with her, right? And he goes, yep. I said, Alan, she's 16, dude. How much time do you think she's going to want to spend with you when she's 16 anyway, much less a father she grew up who worked you know, 70, 80 hours a week, who she never saw but 15 minutes a day. How much time do you think she's going to want to spend with you? You know, and by the way, what happens to an 18-year-old girl, 16-year-old girl, who has all the money in the world, who never needs anything again in her life? I said, have you ever met somebody like this, who everything was given to them, they never had to work a day in their life? Oh, God. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's the part that sticks with me. It's like, yeah, right. I want my kids to work and <laughs> right. make, make their own living. The whole point of this is, in Alan's mind, he was saying that he was doing it for his kids. He was doing it for his family. But his actions were not in alignment with what he said was most valuable to him. So that's stage one. That's creating the vision. And I know that sounds corny. This is not just a goal-setting, you know, cheesy little workshop. This is, this is real stuff. Um, if Alan says that his family is most important to him, the question I asked him is, have you ever asked your daughter what that looks like to her? Because I can pretty much guarantee if you ask a six-year-old little girl, you know, if given the choice, six-year-old girl, would you rather have, you know, millions of dollars when you're 16 or would you rather have some time with daddy right now? I mean, any six-year-old girl on earth would say, I want time with daddy. I don't even know what that means, Right. So if you truly are doing it for your kids and your family, then let's ask them what's important to them, right? Not just assume. So that's stage one, but then we have to go through stage two, three, and four to actually pull this stuff off financially. Alan still has some financial goals that he wants to hit, and I'm all for that. I am in no way suggesting that you should make less money or, you know, live in a van down by the river, (laughs) you know. I want you to make a ton, but I want you to do it in a way that's congruent with what you say is important to you, not what I say is important, what you say is important to you. So that's the process I'm going to take everybody through at the RPOA uh, meeting. I'll take you through all four stages. And if you do this and just come listen for 90 minutes, you don't even have to be, uh, you don't have to say I'm going to do everything. Just come and listen. And I'm telling you, you'll be convinced of this. And when you are, if you decide to apply it, it will change your whole life. And I know Listen, people hear this garbage all the time on TV about how, you know, dishwashing detergent changes your life, and it's garbage. We know that. This, however, will change your whole <laughs> life. Just trust me and show up. All right. Great, great, great. So you're going to be speaking February 24th. That's a Saturday, February 24th, from 3.30 to 5. Or yep. actually, well, your slot is 3.30 to 5.30. Um and the conference itself is February 22nd through 24th, which is Thursday through Saturday. Uh, this is 2018, and it's here in Grand Rapids at the DeVos Place Convention Center. And you can register for free by going to rpoaonline.org. That's rpoaonline.org. And, uh, Sean, I, I, I'm really excited to, to hear your presentation. I mean, I think we got a great preview of it uh, in this conversation. I mean, the whole life and air concept uh, is, is really, it's, it's a powerful concept. And, and I think it's going to really make a lot of people think about the way they're conducting their business and what's really important to them. Um, and, I, and best of all, you know, when you come to the conference and you hear all the other speakers talk about these great strategies for making money in real estate, this is something that works with any strategy, no matter how, what business you're in 
or right. how you're making money, this this really uh, supersedes all of that. Yeah, and uh, one thing I want to interject too before we finish up. Some people hear me with the no debt thing, especially rental property owners, which I know there will be a lot here. Some people hear that and they go, oh, well, now I'm tuning out everything he says because what I've been doing has been working for me. I'm not suggesting that that's not working for you. All I'm suggesting is, is that when you design your business, you design it with your vision in mind first. And when I designed mine, it didn't have debt in it. Yours might look different than mine. I'm okay with that. I just want you to have whatever yours looks like. So yeah, man. Anything else you want to say before we wrap it up? Man, I'm just looking forward to, to personally meeting everybody there. Uh, if, if you are here in this podcast now, please come up and introduce yourself to me while I'm there. I love to get to know people and what, hear about what your stories are. And if there's any way that I can help you while I'm there, I'm literally flying up that morning and I think I'm flying back out in the evening and I'm doing that so I can make sure I'm with my family, but still sharing the message too. But, uh, man, I, I really want to hear you, and for the time that I do have there, I'm an open book. So ask anything you want to ask, and let's hang out and get to the nitty-gritty and enjoy life together. Fantastic. Well, Sean, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us today. You got it. Thanks for having me. This episode was sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single-family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And Point Central, the leading provider of enterprise-scale smart home automation for short- and long-term rental property managers. Learn more at pointcentral.com. You've been listening to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association. You can find out more at rpoaonline.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review.